We are in the Gospel of Mark this evening. And I I always open up with this story. Uh, I can't remember where I got it, um, but I'm going to just read it to you because I think it's very pertinent for um, our study in Mark, our study in the Gospels as a whole. It says this, some years ago, one of the world's renowned scholars of the classics, that is the classic Greek writings, Dr. E.V. Ryu, completed a great translation of Homer into modern English. He was 60 years old, and he'd been an agnostic all his life. The publisher soon approached him again and asked him to translate the Gospels. When Ryu's son heard this, he said, it will be interesting to see what father will make of the four Gospels. It will be even more interesting to see what the four Gospels will make of Father. He didn't have to worry very long. Within a year's time, Dr. Ryu, the lifelong agnostic, agnostic excuse me, responded to the Gospels he was translating and became a committed follower of Jesus. His story is a marvelous testimony to the transforming power of God's word. I bring that up because I want you to think the same question. What will the Gospels make of me? How am I, as I study this over the next couple of weeks, or as I've already been studying this, how will I be transformed by studying the Word of God more specifically? How will I be transformed by seeing Jesus more fully? Really, when it comes down to it, the purpose of tonight's study is to dive into the gospel of Mark. And in so doing, we will see uh, the comparison, or the compassion, excuse me, of Christ Jesus for a lost and dying world. And that compassion drove him to the cross. Jesus is, as Mark opens in chapter 1, verse 1, the Son of God who came to rescue the lost. Jesus is the Son of God who came to rescue the lost. Let's take a moment and, and pray before we dive in this evening. Father, we would ask that you would work mightily tonight, that you will continue to do so as we study through the gospel of Mark. And as we've studied through Matthew, we will study in Luke and John in the upcoming days. Father, we'd ask that you would reveal yourself more fully to us, that you would help us to have a more complete view of Jesus, our Lord and Savior, that we would understand who he is more fully and be driven to worship and adore him more completely. Father, show us his heart and his compassion this evening, we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Well, just by a quick way of review, remember, what is a gospel? When specifically talking about a genre of literature, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are the Gospels. And the Gospels are best described as selective, topical narratives or historical biographies of Jesus Christ from a theological perspective. So when talking of the genre of literature of a Gospel, That's what they are. They're a biography of Jesus from a theological perspective. Now, remember, there are four different Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. This is in your book, and we covered this last time. This is really just an overview of what are covered uh, in the Gospels. So Matthew covers the teaching of Jesus. They shows his kingship. There's an audience that are primarily Jewish, and the key word there is fulfilled. Jesus came to fulfill the law and the prophets. Tonight, we'll look at Mark. The emphasis is Jesus' miracles. He is the redeemer. The audience is primarily Roman, and the key word is immediately. If you've read through Mark any time recently, you have read the word immediately multiple times. It's used over 30 times in this short 16-chapter gospel. We'll cover Luke next week, and then, Lord willing, the following week, we'll look at the gospel of John. Now, remember, we break the Gospels down into two groups, though, the synoptics and John. 
The synoptics are the first three, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and then John is more of a, uh, a theological uh, treatise uh, on the life of Jesus uh, as John reflects back on Jesus' life after many years uh, of, of Jesus' uh, after his departure, after his death, burial, and resurrection. So the synoptics are Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and in essence, the synoptics cover the majority of the same material. They're a chronological recounting of the life of Jesus. They each have the same overarching purpose to explain who Jesus is, his life and his ministry. And they're all inspired by God to give us a more complete picture of Jesus in his life and ministry from three different perspectives with three different audiences uh, to view Jesus, the one God man. So, Let's dive in then to the Gospel of Mark. I would encourage you, if you haven't done so already, take some time out of the rest of this week and read in one sitting, or two if you have to, read the whole Gospel of Mark, uh, all 16 chapters from chapter 1 to chapter 16. Um, if you did that, it takes about two hours. Uh, I listened to it um, on my uh, Bible app um, in two commutes. So I, I drove into work and I drove home from work. Uh, I live in Forest Lake and I work here. Uh, and I listened to it in two commutes. And it was greatly encouraging to my heart to just work through a large section, a large chunk of Scripture in a consistent form. What happens when you read Scriptures in, in large sections or listen to them in large sections is you're able to hear key words. You're able to put together thoughts that are similar as the whole whole narrative goes along. Because remember, most of the time, especially the letters, were read aloud. And I wouldn't think that I'd be far off to say that the Gospel of Mark was read aloud before it was even um, studied intentionally. It was read aloud to the churches, as we'll see most specifically probably uh, in Rome itself, to new Gentile believers who wanted to know or have a more full picture of who Jesus was. So it's very beneficial. I've found it to be so in my life, and I know that you would as well, to sit down and be very intentional to take away some time just to consistently read or listen to an extended portion of the scriptures. And, and Mark is a great um, book to do that with because it moves very fast and it's not very long, all things considered. So I would really, truly encourage you to do that. Well, now as we work through it, though... Um, we see Mark is uh, titled just that, the Gospel of Mark. Mark was a contemporary of uh, Paul and John and the apostles. Uh, Mark was very potentially, as we'll see in a moment, around uh, during the life of Jesus. Um, Mark... Um, was uh, really quite an interesting fellow when it comes to the early church. And historically, there's not much debate as to Mark's authorship of this gospel um, or his authority to write such a gospel. Uh, church history uh, shows us there's actual quite a bit of support of the Markan uh, authorship of this gospel. Papias, who we covered a little bit last week, Papias is an early church father um, who was a contemporary uh, and very potentially knew some of the 12 apostles and was probably influenced by them greatly. He says this of the gospel of Mark. Mark became Peter's interpreter and wrote accurately all that he remembered, not indeed in order of the things said or done by the Lord, for he had not heard the Lord, nor had he followed him, but later on, as I said, he followed Peter, who used to give teaching as necessity demanded, but not making, as it were, an arrangement of the Lord's oracles, oracles, so single points as he remembered them. For to one thing he gave attention, to leave nothing of what he had heard and to make no false statements in them. So Mark, a contemporary of the apostles, wrote this, and he uh, 
went and did it specifically to make no false statements and to record the, uh, the stories that Peter, the apostle, had conveyed. This is also uh, cohesive with what Justin Martyr says. Justin Martyr was born in about the year 100, lived to about 165, and was an early church apologist. And when Justin Martyr... It, excuse me, is quoting from the book of Mark, specifically 317, he says this, Mark is the memoirs of Peter. Mark is the memoirs of Peter. So these are uh, the collective uh, stories, recollections of the apostle Peter. Irenaeus, another early church father who uh, was a contemporary of the Apostle John and a good friend of Polycarp, says this, Irenaeus. Now, after the death of these, that is, Peter and Paul, Mark, the disciple and interpreter of Peter, himself also transmitted to us in writings the things preached by Peter. So that's three early church fathers within the first 150 years of the church that say that Mark wrote this and Mark was the scribe, if you will, for the apostle Peter. So the reason why the gospel of Mark is accepted as canonical, uh, canonical excuse me, and authoritative is because it has apostolic authority as Mark wrote what the apostle Peter experienced uh, there firsthand as an eyewitness. So as we move on, um, let's ask the question of uh, who was Mark? Mark is mentioned many times in the New Testament. Uh, I think I have seven instances here. Um, and there's seven different sections of scripture that uh, give us a picture of who uh, Mark was. First and foremost, Mark lived in Jerusalem. Mark lived in Jerusalem. In Acts chapter 12, we, are, we jump into the scene where Peter had been imprisoned, remember? Um, and James had been killed. Herod was uh, thrilled at the response he got from the Jews. So he arrested Peter. Peter gets put into jail there in Jerusalem. And the night before Peter is to be put to death, what happens? The cell doors open. Peter is basically slapped awake by an angel. The chains fall off and he's led out of the prison into the city there. And where does he go? He goes to Mark's mother's house where all the saints, probably about a hundred of them, were gathered and were up all day and night praying for the safe release of the apostle Peter. So we got Mark living there. At least his mother lived there in Jerusalem. He was very potentially raised in Jerusalem. Secondly, we see in uh, the book of Acts, chapters 12 through 15, uh, which we'll dive into, Lord willing, in a couple of weeks, that Mark went on the first missionary journey of Paul and Barnabas. Mark went on the journey with them. He was there. He knew Barnabas. He knew Paul. He traveled with them. He taught with them. He told people about Jesus with them on that first missionary journey uh, there. Um, but... As we find out in Acts 13, verse 13, and is confirmed in Acts 15, verses 36 through 41, Mark left the journey early that offended Paul because he felt that Mark deserted them halfway through. And so Paul was not going to take Mark on another missionary journey. This is the same John Mark uh, that, that is there. This is the same John Mark that writes the gospel of Mark. So there's strife. Um, the reason why Barnabas uh, really pulls for him is because Barnabas was a great man of God who was very gracious and inclusive of those uh, people that were helpful, but also because Mark was the cousin of Barnabas. Mark was the cousin of Barnabas. We see that in Colossians chapter 4, specifically verse 10 there, as Paul is writing, um, telling the, the church at Colossae that Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, greets them. Peter must have had a really close relationship with Mark, not only because he wrote his gospel, but look how Peter there in 1 Peter chapter 5 refers to Mark. He calls him 
my son. My son. Does that mean that Peter was his dad? No. What that more than likely means is that Mark was a disciple of Peter's. Peter uh, discipled him. Peter spent intentional time with Mark, training him as Jesus had commissioned them to do in Matthew chapter 28 in the Great Commission, to teach them the things that Jesus had taught others, uh, the the apostles specifically. So uh, it it also could mean very well that Mark, uh, that Peter, excuse me, shared the gospel with Mark and Peter led Mark to the Lord. Um, I think a lot of times when we think of Paul and Timothy, uh, it's that same type of relationship there. So Paul and Timothy have the same relationship as Peter and Mark do. Uh, Later on in 2 Timothy chapter 4, we recognize that uh, Paul eventually reconciled his relationship with Mark. He calls on Timothy to send Mark his way because he's valuable to him valuable to him and his ministry in 2 Peter chapter 4. And then lastly, just uh, by way of maybe a little bit of comedic relief, but also potentially to give even more eyewitness uh, accountability or credit credit to Mark, uh, scholars do believe uh, that Mark may have been the naked boy running away from Jesus at his arrest in Mark 14. Um, And I think the the evidence there is pretty heavy because... um, If Mark was with Jesus and to humble himself, uh, he talks about it. Otherwise, it's a very obscure passage that no one would really uh, know or even want to think about. So maybe Mark does throw himself into the end of the gospel of Mark by saying he was that young boy that was there at the betrayal and arrest of Jesus. And he ran away. And remember what happened. The Roman guards grasp him. And they basically pull off the sheet that he's wearing. and He runs away naked from the Roman guards there that arrested Jesus. So this is who the author of the gospel of Mark is, John Mark. We, we meet him quite a bit in the New Testament. But when it comes to um, the date that this was written, um, I really believe um, that scholars uh, are, are pretty at a consensus when they say that the date of the book of Mark is somewhere between 65 and 67. Conservatively, um, there are scholars who will say that uh, Mark was the first and earliest gospel written in the year 48, which I don't know that there's a lot of credibility to that, but very potentially it could have been the first gospel written uh, that early, somewhere between 48 and, and 55, which would have been very close to the death, burial, and resurrection and ascension of Jesus. Um, But even if it is written at a later date, say there, 65 to 67, again, 30 to 35 years after Jesus, that's a very, very close recounting of Jesus' life. It brings credibility, again, to Mark. Uh, Mark is written primarily to uh, Roman Gentile believers who are enduring persecutions underneath Emperor Nero. Now, Nero was no kind guy. He doesn't even look very kind in that picture. Um, But he was the one who really, one of the emperors that really began to harshly persecute Christians. Harshly persecute him to the point where he would bind them, tar them, flay them, put them on stakes, and turn them into torches into his um, feasts that he would hold in his compound. This was not a nice man. These were not nice times to be a follower of Jesus. They needed encouragement, and very potentially, this is why Mark's gospel is so concise and so to the point to help people see Time and again, through all kinds of persecutions, through all kinds of trials, Jesus is worth it. He is the Savior. Endure trials and tribulations because Jesus is the Christ and he will rescue you for he came to ransom many. So that's uh, really what it comes down to. Just some quick fast facts about the gospel of Mark. Mark's the shortest gospel. Mark contains the most miracles uh, really, when it comes to reading through them, uh, as, you, as you ponder really what's going on in the book of Mark, Mark focuses in on the humanity 
and the deity of Jesus through his miraculous works. He doesn't really focus on the writings of Jesus. There's not uh, long uh, teaching discourses like, say, in Matthew or Luke. It's pretty staccato from miracle to miracle, from scene to scene. And um, what we see then there in the Gospel of Mark is that the disciples of Jesus and Jesus himself are constantly moving from one thing to the next. That's why uh, a key word in the gospel of Mark is the word immediately. Immediately they went here, then immediately went there, and then immediately they went to this place. It goes on and on and on quickly. So, really just to, to bring it all home, this is Mark's resume. Mark lived during the time of Jesus He spent time with the apostles. He was an early disciple. He went on a missionary journey with Paul. He was close to Peter. The church was in his mother's house. He was a companion and co-worker with Luke. He went on a missionary journey with Barnabas. And Mark was an eyewitness who experienced the beginning of the church age. A pretty solid resume, if you ask me, as to the historicity and veracity of this man's eyewitness account through Peter's writings. So, now the question is this. How does Mark break down? Well, in your book, in your text there, specifically on page 41, Dr. Mock has a very simple outline. And I think it's a great outline. We're not going to go by it tonight. I'm going to take it a different route. But really, chapters 1 through 10 are the service of Christ. Chapters 11 through 15 are the sacrifice of Christ. And then chapter 16, the resurrection, is the success of Christ. Uh, Many... um, Commentators would say that uh, Mark is just a passion narrative, a passion of the Christ narrative with a long introduction. Because as you read through it or listen through it, you've got the first almost 11 chapters uh, of Jesus' works and miracles, and it goes fast, 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 fast. And then Mark slows down in chapter 11 through chapter 16 and spins five chapters, six chapters on Jesus's last week on earth. So it goes really fast to the end and slows down. So it's a passion narrative with a long introduction and it's the gospel to the Roman world. Now, if I had to boil down uh, the purpose of the book of Mark, I'd said this, it was to give a brief and reliable account of the life of Jesus to the Roman world. Mark presents Jesus, this is what MacArthur says, as the suffering servant of the Lord. His focus is on the deeds of Jesus more than his teaching, particularly emphasizing the service and the sacrifice. So Mark is brief, but he gives a very full account of the life and ministry of Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Mark, in one verse, is the Gospel of Mark, chapter 10 and verse 45, where Jesus himself says this, and we'll dig into it in a minute. He says this, for even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And as we look at the Gospel of Mark this evening, this verse is what drives the whole Gospel This is who Jesus is. He's the son of man. He came not to be served, but to serve. And more than that, he came to give his life as a ransom for many. So let's take a minute and let's discuss just with the people around you, why is Mark's resume so impressive and how does it bring credibility to his authorship? Why is Mark's resume so impressive and how does it bring credibility to his authorship? Ready, set, discuss. All right, so why is Mark's resume so impressive or is it? And how does it bring credibility to his authorship or does it? Anyone? Yeah. 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 He, he, 
he was right in the middle of all of it. I mean, we could, we could think that he, if he knew Peter, he probably knew the rest of the apostles. He knew Paul. He knew a lot of the early church. He was right there on uh, the cutting edge, so to speak, of the movement of the gospel from Jerusalem to Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. Yeah, very good. Yeah, there, there, that's got to be very interesting to see how that, I, I mean, like I said last week, maybe there will be this IMAX in the sky in glory where we get to see firsthand what took place there. So we'll see, we'll see. But we'll definitely meet these people because they're not just characters in a story. They're actual people who actually lived in an actual time and space. So yeah, very good. Anything else? Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. Why didn't Peter write it down? Um, I don't know. And and I think that's really what it comes down to. Um, According to, uh, I think that was Irenaeus, it was after Peter's death that, that, was, that this was written. So that could very well could have been uh, that Peter wrote first and second Peter. And then after he died, um, that slice of tradition says that the church in Rome begged him to begged Mark to write down the sayings of Peter. So that could have been why. Um, but uh, I, I, don't, I really don't know. Uh, other than saying, well, he wasn't inspired of God to write down um, the gospel itself, but Mark was. Good question, though. Anyone else? Yeah, Scott. Yeah, yeah. It, it, could, yeah, it could be that um, uh, at, at that time, Peter didn't have the ability to write. Yeah, we'll see. But either way, it's written down. It's, um, it's consistent, and it's, it's, it's the truth is there that it was written by Mark as Peter's accounts uh, to the church in Rome. Very good. Well, let's continue on. Let's dive into the text. I turned my mic off. That's not wise to do. Uh, uh, let's dive into the text. So first and foremost, what I want to do is jump into uh, this section here in Mark chapter 10. I don't generally jump into the middle of a book when I study it, but I think it's important to get the gist of the ministry of Jesus through the message of Mark by jumping into Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10, we'll look specifically at verses 32 through 45, and we'll see that Jesus came to give his life as a ransom. So uh, just follow along as I read Mark chapter 10, verses 32 through 45. And they were on the road going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking ahead of them, and they were amazed, and those who followed were afraid. And taking the twelve again, he, Jesus, began to tell them what was to happen to him, saying, We are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles, and they will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him. And after three days, he will rise." And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came up to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit one at your right hand and one at your left in your glory. And Jesus said to them, You do not know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? And they said to him, we're able. And Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. And when the 10 heard it, they began to be indignant at James and John. And Jesus called them to him and said to them, you know, that those who are considered rulers over the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many." 
So what we see here in this specific text are three main movements. We see Jesus' mission, and we see the disciples' mission, and then we see Jesus' purpose statement. So really, what's Jesus' mission? As we look at verses 32 through 34, we see that Jesus lived his life because he was going somewhere on purpose. He came to die. And by this time in life and ministry, he knew it. And by this time in the book of Mark, he is on his way from Caesarea Philippi in the north to Jerusalem in the south. So Jesus is well on his journey to Jerusalem. If we were to read a little bit further, uh, the last paragraph there in chapter 10 places Jesus specifically in Jericho, 18 miles from Jerusalem. If you've been to Israel, you know that Jericho is there in the Jordan Valley between the Dead Sea and the Sea of Galilee, and Jerusalem is just up the hill, 18 miles from there. You go from the valley, you walk up the foothills, and then you're there in the capital city, there at Mount Zion and Mount Moriah, where Abraham was and where Jesus was to be crucified. And they are there in that final leg of his journey. And here Jesus in verses 32 through 34 for the third time tells them, we are going to Jerusalem on mission because the son of man is going to be handed over and killed. Now that term there, son of man, in the book of Mark specifically, is Jesus's favorite self-designation. When he's talking of himself in the gospel of Mark, he uses the term son of man. And really what it is, is it shows us his humanity. He is the son of mankind. He is a person. He is Jesus of Nazareth who came, who was a great teacher. But if we throw in the Old Testament context to the title son of man, which comes from the book of Daniel, specifically chapter 7, We understand that that term, son of man, is um, a messianic title. Turn with me, if you would, to Daniel chapter 7, and and let's dig into this a minute. Daniel, the prophet in Babylon under King Nebuchadnezzar, says this, Daniel 7, 13. It's in the midst of one of his visions. He says, I saw in the night visions... And behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. And he came to the ancient of days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. Again, there's a lot to unpack in there, but we recognize that Daniel's having a vision. He sees this vision of one like a son of man, the title there, that messianic title, coming from the clouds of heaven and is before the ancient of days. Who's the ancient of days? That's Yahweh, God the Father, the creator of heavens and earth. And he stands before him and given to that son of man is dominion, glory, and a kingdom. Dominion, glory, and a kingdom. Just let's, let's think of that for a second. That Just that second characteristic, glory. Does God share his glory with anyone? No. So this has to be a very special figure. This has to be a very special person. And as we know now, Jesus, the son of man, being both fully God and fully man, is God. Thus, God's not sharing his glory he is going, he is, he's part of the Godhead. He's a second person of the Trinity. And he has dominion over peoples and nations and languages and they should serve him. Which is very interesting because chapter 10 and verse 45 of the book of Mark says that he came not to be served, but to serve. So Jesus recognizes as a son of man, there's going to be a time when he's going to be served, honored, and glorified. But in the time that he's here and the here and now on earth, he's not to be served, but he's going to serve and set his life as a ransom for many. 
but we'll dig in that in a, in a moment. So that's Jesus explaining Mark chapter um, 32 or chapter 10, excuse me, verses 32 through 34. He's, he's explaining again to the disciples that he's going to Jerusalem. He's going to be handed over, but he is going to break the bonds. The, the middle section there is uh, James and John demanding Jesus to give them glory because remember, they had an unrealistic expectation of Jesus. They expected him to come as a conquering lion, the king who was going to rule and reign immediately as he ushered in the kingdom. They didn't understand that that's a mountaintop, but there's a valley in between before that comes again. They wanted to have all the earthly glory that they could get. And Jesus asks them specifically, can you drink the cup that I'm going to drink? And, and can you be baptism with, baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? In essence, what Jesus is saying is, are you going to, like me, endure the very wrath of God and be entirely immersed in it? The answer, obviously, is no, they can't do that. But because of their pride and because of the will of God being accomplished in James and John's lives, we know that they did deal with some earthly judgment. We know that James was one of the, was the very first apostle to be martyred in Acts chapter 12. And we know that John, the apostle, was, uh, they, they tried to kill him multiple times. They, they boiled him in oil, yet he did not die. And then he was exiled to a desert island in the Aegean Sea called Platmos, a prison island where he was given the vision of the book of Revelation and he was inspired to write it. But he, they did face some pretty hard times from human judgment because of their faithfulness to Jesus. But what Jesus is saying is, I'm going to be killed. Are you going to bear God's wrath for the sins of humanity? And the obvious answer is they couldn't do that even though they thought they could. So Jesus says, I, I can't. It's not my, my authority to give you the ability to sit in my right or left in glory. That's God's authority alone. The Father's authority alone to put people there. But you're going to be tried through fire, if you will. And he finally gets to the point where all the rest of the disciples, the other 10, hear what James and John want. And we're told there in verse 13, or not 13, excuse me, 41, that they became indignant or furious with James and John for asking such a thing. And before a huge brawl breaks out, what does Jesus do? He pulls them all together and he uses this as a teaching opportunity. He says, guys, listen up. Those who are uh, rulers in this world, they lord their authority over those who are under them. They exercise authority continually. But verse 43, it must not be so among you. Whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. Who's the you that he's talking about? Well, most specifically, he's talking to the apostles, the leaders of the early church. He's calling them to humility and service, not authority and dominion. He's calling them to love and be compassionate as he is, to shepherd the flock as he did. And then he ultimately tells them what we've covered already in verse 45. For even the son of man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus, the one and only Lord and Savior came to serve, not be served. He's the only person in all creation who would be worthy to be served, bowed down to, and magnified. But he says, I hadn't come to receive that here and now. I came to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. Now that word ransom there, it really carries the, uh, the definition or the undertone of a price to be paid to free a slave from bondage. 
in our common vernacular, that ransom there is, is the price that's paid to a bad guy to release a captive or a hostage. And think about it this way. Jesus paid the price to release our bonds and our shackles of captivity to sin and Satan and to transfer us from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light through the blood of our Savior, the Lord Jesus. That is why he came. This is why I think it's so important to to look at this text before we dive into the book of Mark to understand that this is Jesus' driving purpose in this gospel that he came not to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And the question is this, friends. Do we imitate Jesus to those around us? Or are we lording our authority or supposed authority over them? Are we there to love, to serve, to shepherd, to be compassionate towards those who are lost and to serve them and care for them? Or do we expect them to serve us and do all that we need done for each and every one of us? I think we ought to take on the posture that Jesus took on as specifically as followers of his who bear his name to compassionately love and serve those around us, to honor, glorify, and magnify the name of Jesus and be given the opportunity to share the good news of Christ Jesus, our Savior, with those that we come into contact with. This should drive us because Jesus breaks the shackles of sin, shame, and captivity because he died in our I think Paul really puts it quite well when he explains this whole scenario in Ephesians chapter 2 verses 1 through 10. Just write that down in the margin next to this and uh, study through that this week. I'm sure you've done it before um, and I know that we'll do it again, but Ephesians 2, 1 through 10 breaks down very well into three sections there. Verses 1 through 3, 4 through 9, and 10, uh, we were all dead in our trespasses and sin, but God in his grace sent Jesus to take our place through his resurrection, and now we serve him, we honor him, and magnify him, and do good works out of obedience and love for our Savior. Well, what we're going to see through the the rest of this evening is Jesus is moved by compassion. Jesus is moved by compassion. I think you're going to be hard-pressed as you study the book of Mark and look at the miracles of Jesus to not see this main theme. What drives Jesus when he interacts with those that he heals and he, those, the demons that he exercises and, and all the miracles that he does, Jesus is driven by compassion. There's not another, there's not a time in the gospel of Mark where you see a miracle of Jesus that's not inspired, driven by the compassion of Jesus on those who are lost and broken. I mean, think about this just for a moment with me. Paul tells us in Colossians chapter one that Jesus was with God in the beginning and he was the creator and he is the sustainer. And when Jesus, who is the creator, steps into his creation in the broken, sin-sick world that we live, imagine the heartfelt compassion that would had to have exuded from him. He knew what it was supposed to be like. And he stepped into a wretched world with disease, brokenness, and sin. We're introduced first to the compassion of Jesus, um, very similarly to what we looked at last week um, in in the healing of a leper. Turn with me to Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1, we're not going to dig too deep into it, but uh, I think it's important because it sets the tone there. Mark chapter 1 and verse 40 says this, and a leper came to him imploring him and kneeling, said to him, if you will, you can make me clean. We covered that last week in in Matthew chapter eight. But 
we give, uh, we're given a, a bit deeper glimpse into the motivation of Jesus in verse 41. Verse 41 says this, moved with pity. Moved with pity, he stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I will be clean. That modifier there, moved with pity, in the Greek, uh, it, it, it builds a picture of Jesus felt it deep within his guts, this pity, this compassion, this Love for this man who was filled, Luke says, with leprosy. And like I said, think about this. The creator stepping into creation, he spoke into being Adam. And he created Eve. He was there with God the Father. He saw the perfection of humanity as the capstone of creation. And now he's in his earthly ministry. He steps into Galilee and a man falls before him filled with leprosy. And Jesus' compassion exudes from his innermost being. And verse 42 says this. Or verse 41 He stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I will be clean. And immediately, verse 42, the leprosy left him and he was made clean. Immediately. It happened in an instant. Jesus reached in, touched this man, and the ailment was entirely gone. He was made perfectly clean. Immediately. In an instant, because of the deep-seated compassion which he had for this individual who was created in the image of God, he's moved to do it, and it happens. Question is this. If that was the compassion that Christ had, and we're supposed to emulate the character of Christ in the here and now, is that the compassion we have on those who are lost? Are we moved with gut-wrenching pity or compassion because we know the separation that sin creates? Are we willing to step in love and care for and share the gospel with those who are perishing because souls are at stake? Jesus did. And I think as we think through maybe a picture of this, we know how devastating leprosy is, but leprosy, I think, is also a picture of sin within our lives. It grows slowly inside of us. It numbs us to our brokenness. It disfigures and really kills us from the inside out. We must be rescued from sin like a leper must be cured from leprosy. And if you view, and I'm not trying to be gross here, but if you view your your lost friends, family, and neighbors as though because of their sin sickness, it's like leprosy, can you not be moved to compassion? Can you not be moved to to love and to service and to ultimately the most gracious, loving thing that you could ever do is to tell them the truth about Jesus? It should drive us, the compassion, the pity that we feel on others should drive us like it drove Jesus. We also see the compassion of Jesus in Mark chapter 5. Turn there with me, Mark chapter 5. I think uh, this is probably one of the best texts to preach on Easter that there's ever been. Mark chapter 5, specifically verses 1 through 20, jumps us straight into a scene that took place very well right here. On the eastern shores of the Sea of Galilee, in the modern day area of Kersey, very potentially in these rocks and caves... Jesus goes to the other side of the sea from Capernaum. Capernaum would have been on the west side. They paddle across, and as Jesus, immediately as he reaches the shore over there, it says that he's met by a man with an unclean spirit. 
from the land of the Gerasenes. That's the land of the Gentiles on the other side of the Sea of Galilee. And he immediately falls down, verse 6, and fell, ran and fell down before him. And crying out with a loud voice, he said, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God, I adjure you by God, do not torment me. For he was saying to him, come out of the man, you unclean spirit. So Jesus lands ashore, recognizes that there's a demon-possessed man running out to him, and he commands the demon, get out of here. Now, let's be introduced a bit more to this demon-possessed man. Verse 2 of chapter 5, he lived among the tombs. Verse 3, excuse me. And no one can bind him anymore, not even with a chain. For he had an, often been bound with shackles and chains, but he wrenched them apart and broke the shackles to pieces. No one had the strength to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always crying out and cutting himself with stones. And when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and fell down before him. This is a man in dire need of rescue. Jesus lands on the shores right there is met by this man who howls from the caves. Uh, very potentially, there could be shards of metal in this area from the shackles and chains that he wrenched apart. Night and day, unable to be quiet and still at peace. And we come to find out as Jesus interacts with this man that the demon that is within him is named Legion. Why? He says, because we are many. Now, a legion in Roman times is a, is a group of about 6,000 soldiers. And that's the name of this demon. In one man, multitudes of demons possessing him really with the ultimate desire to destroy the image of God within this man. He tried night and day to cut himself to end his life, but he couldn't because he had an interaction with Jesus that was coming. Jesus meets him right when he needs it most. And as we continue on in this text, we see that Jesus casts out this demon and has an interaction with the demons. And the demons say, don't cast us out of the region. Cast us into these pigs because there's a herd of 2,000 pigs on the hillside there. And immediately they get cast into the pigs and the pigs go off the cliff because that's the satanic demonic prerogative, death and destruction. And I think just for a moment, we have to recognize that Demons are real. C.S. Lewis says it very well. There are two equal and opposite errors into which our race, that is humanity, can fall about the devils, that is demons. One is to disbelieve in their existence, and the other is to believe and feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in them. They themselves are equally pleased by both errors and hail the materialist and the magician in the same delight. We can't say that demons don't exist be on one side of the spectrum, and we can't be on the other side of the spectrum and say that that's the only thing that we focus on. We have to be in the middle recognizing they exist, but we're not to worship them or give them more uh, time and opportunity than we need to give them. They exist, Jesus has authority over them, and we are in the name of Jesus. We should not go about seeking to exercise the demonic in the name of Jesus. That's just asking for trouble. But Jesus shows up at this man's worst time, casts the demons out into the herd of pigs, and the pigs go off the edge. And then it says that the herdsmen, the Gentile herdsmen who are running the pigs, were terrified. They go back to the Decapolis, to town, and they bring people with them saying, look what happened. 
And the townspeople beg Jesus to leave their region. They couldn't handle it. There was too much chaos, too much crazy going on. And so Jesus submits to their request. Gets ready to jump in the boat and leave this side of the sea to go back to the other. And just as the herdsmen beg Jesus to leave, the demon, formerly demon-possessed man, who is sitting, clothed, and in his right mind, begs Jesus to, to just let him come with. Jesus, let me come with you. But notice what Jesus says to him in Mark chapter 5 and verse 19. He did not permit him, but said to him, go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. And he went away and began to proclaim in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him and everyone marveled. Do you see the compassion of Jesus here? Meeting this man at the right time, casting the uh, destroying demons out of him, and then says, go tell others about how merciful I have been to you. The compassion that I showed to you when everyone else sent you away to be in your cave, your prison, because they couldn't handle you. I stepped in, I loved you, and there is no one beyond my grasp is what Jesus is showing us here. This is why I think it's one of the most important Easter messages there could ever been. Because anyone who walks through the doors of this building is not beyond the reach of Jesus. And we see it here in this man's life and rescue. He stays there. He goes to the Decapolis, to the cities that are to the east of here, mainly Gentile cities. And what happens? They marvel at what had been done. Why? Because they very well had known him previously. They knew his character. They knew what happened to him. They knew how unable to be subdued that he was. And now this man, clothed in his right mind, transformed by this teacher named Jesus, that's miraculous. I've pondered before, and I would encourage you to ponder the same thing. Maybe this man had a family that he was taken away from because they couldn't handle him. The home broken and destroyed. Maybe he walks up the street, his children are playing in the front, and they cry out, Daddy, as he comes and embraces them and tells them about Jesus. Friends, this is transformative because of the compassion that Christ has on those who are broken. We could go on and on and on and continue with these miracles that Jesus has done to show us his character. Uh, What I really wanted to do is travel to Caesarea uh, Philippi next and go into Mark chapter 9 and and see how Jesus shows his compassion on a little boy who's demon-possessed. I would encourage you, spend some time in Mark chapter 9 this week But let's get to this point primarily. This father is to his wit's end. He brings his little demon-possessed boy who uh, foams at the mouth and convulses and is thrown to the ground. In essence, we'd call that modern-day seizures. This boy has seizures continuously that are trying to claim his life. comes to the disciples, the disciples can't cast the demon out because they try and do it on their own power, not in the name of Christ. There's a commotion. The crowds gather. They start jeering by this time. Who you can't do it? Well, maybe your, your teacher can't, can't cast it out either. Maybe it's too much for him. Jesus comes into uh, the area, very potentially by this river, the beginning of the, the, this is the headwaters of the Jordan River there in Caesarea Philippi. Mary, maybe very well, right in this region is where they were. Jesus steps in, says, what's going on? And this frantic father says, I came because my son is demonized and your disciples couldn't do anything about it. So Jesus figures out what's going on 
And when the demon sees that Jesus is there because of uh, an ultimate desire to destroy the boy, throws him in probably to the worst convulsion ever, to the point where everyone around sees the boy laying there saying, he's dead. And Jesus lifts him up and says, you're healed. You're made new. In the midst of it, the father, as he's interacting with Jesus, he says, I believe, help my unbelief. Have you ever been at that point? With just the overwhelming anxiety of, I can't handle this and no one else can. And you get to the point of, Jesus can help me. I believe, I know that Jesus can help me. Lord, help my unbelief. Give me the faith to believe that you can do this for me and help me to walk in that. That's where this father lands, full of anxiety, not knowing when the next convulsion is going to happen. Brings him to Jesus. Jesus prevails. Why? Because he is moved with compassion to the son and the father, and he has the authority to cast out the unclean spirit. Again, as you work through the book of Mark, you see continually the compassion that Jesus has on people. If we had more time, we'd dive into um, Mark chapter 10, 10 and we'd see blind Bartimaeus there, the, the blind beggar that no one had time for, but Jesus does and heals him. But just as we conclude, I think it's very important to go to the very last verses of the book of Mark. Mark. And see the finished work of Jesus. Why did he come? He came to finish the work to ransom humanity. To reconcile us to himself. To defeat death. What comes previously is the mocking, the trial, the spitting upon, the crucifixion. The death and the burial of Jesus. This is all chapters 14 and 15. And then we get to chapter 16, verses 1 through 8, which read this way. When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, brought spices so that they might go and anoint him. Who? Jesus. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. And they were saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? And looking up, they saw the stone had been rolled back. It was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. And he said to them, do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him? Go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. And they went out and fled from the tomb for trembling and astonishment had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone for they were afraid. This is the garden tomb just outside of the old city, Jerusalem, very potentially the tomb that Jesus himself was laid in. If this is not the tomb, it is one that's very similar to the tomb that Jesus was in. I've been there. Some others of you in this room have been there, and we can testify to you that it's empty. The stone is rolled away. Jesus is not there. But why does a resurrection matter? Well, because dead people don't rise. It is not normal for a person who dies to rise again. To see an empty tomb, if this was Jesus' tomb, to see it empty is to say that Jesus isn't there. And if Jesus isn't there, it means that his work is completed. He came, he lived a perfect life. He had a deep-seated compassion on a broken humanity to the point that he, in the garden of Gethsemane, in Mark chapter 14, is, is so moved that he's sweating drops of blood, praying, Lord, if you can take this cup from me, yet not what my will is, but yours be done. 
And we know that God's will was to put Jesus to death to pay our penalty, to take our place. He was buried and he resurrected. The resurrection is so important because it proves his ministry. Paul uh, has a, a great discourse on the importance of the resurrection in 1 Corinthians 15, 12 through 22, where he in essence says, if, if Jesus didn't raise from the dead, everything that you're doing in the here and now is in vain. You're no more than just a social club gathering. If he didn't raise from the dead, but because he rose from the dead, we have salvation in his name. That's why Peter, in 1 Peter chapter 1, says this. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Why do we have a living hope? Because Jesus resurrected and is alive. What does that mean then? We have an inheritance, eternal life that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, and kept where? In heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. I want to end here with 1 Peter because it shows the apostle Peter's growth. When he first met Jesus, he knew there was something different about him, but he didn't get it. He, he walked with Jesus and he put his foot in his mouth continually, even to the point where he tells Jesus in the night before he's crucified, I'll never deny you. And he denies him multiple times and runs away. Because him and Jesus make eye contact and he weeps the whole way out. But years later, as Peter thinks through this and is inspired of the spirit, of the life, the person, and the ministry, and the reconciliation that Jesus brings, he says this. Jesus has been resurrected. We have hope. We have an inheritance. It's imperishable. It's undefiled. It's unfading. It's not going to ever be taken away. Why? Because we've placed our faith in Jesus and our faith in our inheritance is being guarded for a future salvation, meaning that it's good. Uh, it's as good as done. We will be glorified because Jesus has paid the price. It's finished. He's purchased you. And he guarantees that he will take you to be with himself forever. Why? Because he's the God man who has compassion on the lost, who came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Tomb is still empty. So in conclusion, what do we come to the point of? Who is God in the book of Mark? God is the merciful creator who sent Jesus as a ransom for sin. How does the book of Mark reveal Jesus? It reveals Jesus as the glorious God man who is the Messiah who acts with compassion towards the lost. And why did the Holy Spirit inspire Mark to write this book? Mark was inspired by the Spirit to compose a faithful message of the life ministry, and heart of Jesus for the lost. Let me pray for us and you'll be dismissed. Father, we praise you and we thank you for today. I thank you for your kindness and allowing us the opportunity to be here. And I ask, Lord, that you would give us all a deeper love for Jesus as we've seen his compassionate heart even tonight. Lord, I'd ask that you would drive each and every one of us to have a deep desire to be in your word and to see more fully through the book of Mark who Jesus is. Reveal yourself to us. Unveil your unfailing love. Your deep 
rooted compassion on us. Lord Jesus, that you would be faithful even to the point of death, death on a cross for us, for me, and for my friends. Father, we praise you and we thank you for the faithful message that you inspired Mark to write. In Jesus' name, amen.